And before we go to the action, with about 45 miles left to ride, uh, some of our favourites have had their own problems today. This is Sepp Van Mark here. He had a puncture. He was lucky to have a teammate close by in what is turning out to be a very hotly contested race. He got back into the race and he got back up into the peloton as well. But our big favourite, Fabian Cancellara, as we approach the Molenberg at around about 121 kilometres from the finish, he was stopped at the bottom. Once he got over the top, he was anxiously looking for a team car, finally got off and adjusted the back brake on his rear wheel uh, himself. And then Peter Sagan, the youngster here, he came back to his team car at about 110 kilometres to go. He had a problem with his front brake, and in fact, 10 kilometres later, Peter Sagam has seen off his bike and taking a new bike. They've all rejoined up in the lead group, but it has been a terrific fight to get back into the action. And now, as we go to the live pictures here, take a look at this, because we are seeing riders now in all sorts of trouble. The Sky Team car here has broken down. Uh, this has happened on the Paterberg Paul. We've done one climb of the old Quaramont. We have a breakaway. We had a breakaway of 15 riders throughout much of the day. The gap is down to just over a minute, and there are about 13 riders left in the group. But I'll tell you, we are watching a classic Tour de Flanders, Paul. They are charging across the heart of Flanders, and they're giving no quarter. They are giving no quarter at all. I tell you what, I think this is going to be a much more nervous finish to the Tour of Flanders than we've ever seen before. The climbs are so much more compact. All of the big climbs still to come. Yes, we've been over the old Quarimont once, Phil, but we've got two more times to go. And there are eight more of these Flandrian climbs still left to go. Well, the field at this uh, peloton now, as you can see, is down to about 70 riders here. Uh, Cancelar took a while to get back uh, because he, he split off in the bunch on narrow roads. This is the characteristic of this race, very narrow roads. Greg Van Avermaet, the BMC rider on the American squad to our right, amongst one of the outsiders to possibly win today for Belgium. Uh, Cancelor is trying to fight his way back into the action up here. This is the traffic block on the Paterberg, and uh, this is caused by cars. It's had to replay, in fact, Paul. Uh, that is the Sky car running up the back of the Lambeau credit car, I think. Uh, because the stop go stop go as riders are falling off all of the time and in fact walking on the climbs well they're all very nervous uh, in the main field field but the team managers are also extremely nervous as well they want to be in the order that they've been given the day before this race because that's the best order that they can attain on a race like this and it's extremely important on the narrow roads because if your rider has a mechanical incident and you're in 15th or 16th position in the convoy of cars behind it can mean anything up to a minute before you can actually get in there to help one of your riders now our camera's concentrating here remember these are live pictures concentrating at the head of the peloton uh, but i must tell you that Tyler Farrer, the American on Garmin Barracuda, is in the breakaway and has been all day. And Paul, you were telling me earlier you spoke with Jonathan Vortis. It's part of that plan. Well, Jonathan Vortis said the best plan that they could have would be to try and get Tyler Farrer into the early breakaway. He said if that breakaway group had been four or five riders a lot strong, that wouldn't have been a good situation for us. But with 15 men in a strong breakaway like that, he's very, very happy with the way the situation is unfolding. So, the field concentrating here now. As we are looking here at the peloton, licking their lips perhaps, as they are now about to catch up with that lead group. There's still an awful lot of racing and an awful lot of climbing still to come. This is proving to be a superb course. All the favourites still locked in the big pack. We'll take our break.
and the rides are being proved exactly right. This is proving to be a terrific course, I have to say, Paul, but very much harder indeed. This is the main peloton now tackling the Koppenberg climb. The leaders are down to 11 men, and noticeably, Paul, Philippe Gilbert has got himself right to the front. Well, a lot of riders from Team BMC racing riding near the front end of the main field as well. George Hincapi looking very strong. Former winner of this race, Alessandro Balan, the Italian rider on BMC racing, also riding in the first three or four places. But here you get a chance just to see what sort of damage the famed Koppenberg can do. It is a beast of a climb. And if you're stuck at the back of the race here, you're going to have to chase for an awful long time to make contact once again. Well, unlike the old Quadamont, this is the only time we climb the Koppenberg. You can see from the Flanders flags there, the flags of Flanders are blowing strongly. This is uh, one of the rides, I think it's Andreas Schillinger, who has been dropped from the lead group, and he's checking where the peloton are. And they're right there behind him now, fanning out across the road, dead centre, the champion of Belgium, Philippe Gilbert, being paced by the former champion of Belgium, also on Team BMC, uh, Greg van Avermaet. They're just in the centre of the pack. And in second position there, you can see Alessandro Balan with the world bands around his sleeves, looking extremely strong. Fabian Cancellara just going out of shot there, looking very comfortable indeed at the front end of the main field. He doesn't even seem to have broken a sweat just yet. Well, he has had a rough ride. Now, Tom Bonin, over the last half hour, has been seen to follow him. He's just gone underneath our camera at the moment, so he's not too far back. He hasn't climbed the Koppenberg, though, as strongly as Fabian Cancellara. And uh, it's, uh, we've seen uh, Bonin on in previous Ronde von Flanders or Tour de Flanders attack on this very climb. Yeah, I think all the riders, Phil, this year are a little bit scared about the, the change in the race route because the race, uh, once it comes down to Odenard, does three distinct different circuits, taking in the old Quarimont on each of each occasion. And in fact, uh, talking to Jonathan Vortersfield just before the start of the race this morning, he said a lot of riders are strange of exactly what sort of tactics to adopt because they fear this running towards the finish. Oh, there, there's Civil Chavanel just going off to the left-hand side, taking the risks to try and get himself to the front end of the main field. Riders will do almost anything to get themselves to the front end of the pack in these races. Yes, a reaction from Green Edge. No takers there as he takes a look back at the field. And as we watch the men making their way away from the Koppenberg, I'm delighted to tell you that the women's Tour de Flanders is finished. In first place was Judith Arndt of Germany and the Australian Green Edge team. But Christian Armstrong of the USA is bang on course for a place at the Olympic Games in London as she crossed the line in second place. It was a breakaway as well. So as we're looking here at the leaders, uh, just if we do get a little bit of picture breaker, but it's out of our hands, these are uh, coming live from Belgium. We are sat on the finishing line in Oudenard. A uh, little bit chilly now, the wind is ducking in and out, uh, so the sun is ducking in and out behind the clouds, but a perfect day for racing. And that's Tyler Farrer here. He wanted a long breakaway today. Oh, <laughs> he got one. He certainly did. He's the rider just uh, slipping into second position in the pale blue jersey there. Well, slipping out of view now, wearing number 151. But his Belgian teammate uh, on the Garmin Barracuda squad, Sepp van Mark, is the uni unique team leader of this American squad today. He's already been a, beat, a winner of her race this year, uh, early on in the season, when he beat Tom Bonin to the line in the Omelette Omloop Het Newsblad, which finished not too far away from here. Now, the crowd wait and see who is next up the hill here because the gap is closing down pretty quickly now. There's some of the names left in the breakaway. It was 15 riders. It's down to 11 at the last count. Uh, but the rider behind is actually slipping off the back of the break. As uh, setting the pace here is Baptiste Plankert. Now, a lot of people are speculating, is Baptiste Plankert a member of the famous Plankert family who are from Belgium? And in fact, although he is a Belgian, uh, Paul reliably informs me he's no relation. No relation at all. It's a well-known name here in Belgium because of the great famed dynasty almost of the Plankart brothers, Walter, Eddie and Willy, whose son uh, Joe went on to race and uh, they were exceptionally good bike riders. But of course, Baptiste is no relative at all. The main field now, Phil, are starting to get extremely nervous because they realise now this is crunch time. This is the part of the race when they start again to a repetitive ascent of all these Flandrian climbs. And around here, they call them the Mountains of Flanders. And for these bike riders in this race of 160 miles, they are starting to get rather tough. So 16 climbs in all today. As we switch back to the team car, just before Tyler Farrer grabbed his little bag there, which has got his food for the rest of the day in it. This is the last feeding station, 63 kilometers out from the finish. 
The rider at the back there pulling on his bag was Manuel Belletti in the breakaway. There's Farah, far left of our picture in the blue. I have to say, he's tamed these hills today. He's never looked under pressure on the cobble climbs at all. He rode up the old Quaramont first time, looking extremely comfortable. Well, that was Farah there, just sitting up in the, the pale blue jersey. Hasn't had a win so far to his credit this season, Phil, but he did finish second overall in the early season Tour of Qatar. Philippe Gilbert, nearest camera, in the black, yellow and red jersey of the champion of Belgium. He hasn't shown any form. He's had all sorts of problems there this year. He's had wisdom teeth problems as well. He seems to be recovering, but today the pressure's on him, and this is a typical scene on every corner. We get somebody taking the chance to change a wheel or fall off, and they've spotted it here. All the teammates waiting for the struck and ride. It must be the team leader. Well, this is what happens, you see, Phil. This is why on these narrow roads of the Flanders, uh, this is a pre-assigned pre plan. Kevin Holtzman's, I think. Yeah, if somebody has a problem, one of the riders will swap a wheel with the rider who's had a mechanical problem, allowing the team leader to get back into the race a lot quicker. In fact, it's Oscar Gatto, the rider underneath our camera right now, who had the problem. Now, he is the sprinter and they've decided he is the man and worth the service. Well, you can understand now why they've done that. You see how a lot of riders have been dropped behind because of that climb of the Koppenberg, and in fact, on some of these cobble climbs, the team cars are not allowed to go over. They go through a deviation. So over the top of the climb, if you have an incident, you've got to repair it yourself up until the moment when your team car can get back in behind the race. Maria Borostrata, this is a little section of cobblestones here with no climbs. It's number seven of eight on the day. It's taking us through 194 kilometers covered, which is just under 120 miles. Already under the wheels in perfect racing conditions. Uh, we uh, can tell you there's huge crowds on the actual climb of the old Quaramont. Uh, row after row of marquees and tents and people enjoying themselves. That's one of the big draws now that this race is going past that point three times before it finally finishes in Odenard. Well, this is turning uh, rather interesting because the gap between the leading group of riders who we're following here had come down to just around about the one minute margin over the peloton. But now it's starting to stretch out again. In fact, it's stretched out up to the two minute mark almost. And that's an indication that the big guns in the main peloton are doing exactly what Jonathan's supporters expected this morning. They're starting to watch each other because they're a little bit concerned riding this race a little bit in the unknown because of the change of race route it's made it difficult to know just exactly where to make the efforts of riders who've raced this race four five six times before over the same so oh, it was a massive crash here at the back yes and this is a nasty and that's Cancellara that's in the middle of the road down there well this has been a terrible race for poor Fabian Cancellara he has had mechanical troubles throughout the day hard chases to rejoin and now it looks as though he has fallen now, as I say, these pictures are live. We may get a flashback in a moment, but for the moment, it looks as though he's possibly broken a collarbone here, Paul. I have no idea what has happened here, Phil, but you can see two mate, teammates up alongside him there from the uh, Radio Shack Nissan Trek team. Cancellara is on the ground at the moment. He went down very hard indeed. That grey car is the car of the race doctor, so the race doctor will be up alongside him, but his teammates there are looking extremely concerned. Meanwhile, further up the road, the peloton have gone through... Uh, the feeding station. Uh, no, There's this is actually, it's, it's caused in the feeding station. Uh, right at the back of the peloton, it's been caused. The most dangerous part of the course is when riders snatch these musettes and they've caught out one of the best bike riders in the world, Fabian Cancellara. And by the way they're holding him here, I suspect a broken collarbone. Well, the doctor there in the white jacket is uh, all over Fabian Cancellara. He is making sure that he's OK. He'll make sure he is looked after. If there is any requirement, he will be evacuated immediately to the hospital. And there are a number of very good hospitals close by the race route here this afternoon. But Cancellara is nodding his head there. I think that's an indication, Phil, that he will not be getting up to carry on with this bike race the rider on the left here is the is the new zealand rider jess Sargent, number 165 they're looking down this young new professional on the radio shack team he'll be devastated to see his team captain lying there on the floor mark el Iriza, number 164 the team's race is done here they've all stopped behind with their captain the most outstanding favorite for years uh, to win the tour de flanders today and he spent most of his day on the defensive, it has to be said, with bicycle problems, long chases to rejoin, and now a crash in the feed. Well, uh, back at the front end of the peloton, we're now on the steinberg Dries climb, a 5.3%, maximum gradient 7%. We're looking at around about two minutes, the difference between the leading group of riders and the main peloton, while back down the road, poor old Fabian Cancellara, the Swiss champion, is down on the road and out of this year's Ronde van Vlaanderen.
Yes, there's no doubt that the calling now for the stretcher, I think, for Fabian Cancellara. It's most unfortunate to crash in the feeding state. It's, you know it, Paul, firsthand. It's such a dangerous part of the bike race. It is a very dangerous part of the bike race because you've got a whole bunch of riders going through the feeding station, taking on board bottles and bags at the side of the road. And if somebody drops a bag or a bottle in front of you, it's uh, very easy to hit that bottle, lose control of the machine, and go straight over the top of the handlebars in an uncontrolled fall. And very often, I've always said it, Phil, the most dangerous crashes in a professional bike races are the crashes at slow speed. Well, poor Fabian there. As you can see, there's a little bit of blood around his ear at the moment, so it's a bit of a head injury for sure. And, uh, you know, only moments earlier, he was actually being quoted uh, on the uh, social network as saying, this is the most beautiful race in the world. The crowd are very, very special. It's an honour to race on the route of the Tour de France in front of such enthusiastic people, uh, people such as we see today. He doesn't deserve that, Fabian Cancellara, but he's been on the back heel throughout the day of racing as we come into the last 60 kilometers of the race itself. We still have, uh, after the Steinberg Dries, we've got another six climbs still to come here. And preoccupied still by a breakaway, which is reduced from 15 down to 10. Well, here we're just going over two sections of cobblestones pretty much pinned together. The Mayor Maria Borstrata, 194 kilometers covered, almost 120 miles of racing. And then immediately onto the Donderai section of cobblestones, 127 miles covered. And very shortly after that, we'll have the very nasty little climb of the Kreisberg once again. And this is Herd Stegmans on the front for Omega Pharma Lotto. For Omega Pharma Quickstep, I have to say, <laughs> a lot of these teams are amalgamating and changing their form during the winter transfer season this year. But looking at that long length of the main field, that would be an indicator, especially with these pale blue jerseyed riders on the front, that Tom Bonin, the other pre-race favourite, Phil, is not having a bad ride. Well, Bona has kept himself out of trouble and also, I have to say, largely out of sight today. And he's just made sure he's been in the right place when it matters. Always coming near the front when they start to lift the speed as they turn on to these narrow cobble climbs. As they, uh, the rider on the front that we just seen there, he was an ex-teammate, in fact, of, um, or is an ex-teammate of Tom Bona. This is Matty Heyman, I think, who's having a tremendous ride for the Sky team because he started to try and split them up again. Earlier, he did get a break of six away, uh, but they came back together. Now he's trying again. Popping across the gap in fourth position of those riders, well, up into third position there with the lime green shoes. That, in fact, is George Hincapie, who, if he finishes this year's Ronde van Vlaanderen, or the Tour of Flanders, will set a new participation in the number of finishes in this great classic, going ahead, of course, of the very, very famous Belgian rider, Brick Scotter. Well, what an honour too, and George, an American riding on the hallowed Belgian soil here, and they'll take the record away from the great Belgian, uh, Brick Scotter. Well, we're just looking now at uh, 60 kilometres to go. The 60 kilometres to go is 42. So as we look at the peloton here, little flag up there warning the race, but the pressure is on by Europe car at the moment as they continue to try. In fact, that breakaway has slipped away under the melee at 148. And the reason being poor Fabian Cancellara is down on the road in the feed. And Cancellara is in all sorts of trouble here, almost certainly now. His race is over as we head towards the finish.
Today's special live presentation of the Tour de Flanders is brought to you by Competitive Cyclist. And the gap here now is a minute and 35. Uh, that crash to Fabian Cancellara has allowed them to pull away a little bit, but they're organizing the chase now, especially the French Europe car team, Paul, because it's come back to a minute 35. Yes, but the American squad BMC Racing have still got a lot of strong riders at the front end of that peloton. I just noticed their uh, former world champion Tor Hushop, the Norwegian rider on that squad, moving to the front end of the pack. Maybe they think they can set something up for Philippe Gilbert here this afternoon because although Philippe Gilbert is much better suited to the hilly classics like Liège, Baston Liège, which happens in a couple of weeks' time, he certainly is a Belgian. Phil has always expressed his interest in trying to win this bike race. He hasn't had a great start to the season this year, but certainly if he could come up with the goods on a day like this, he would like to do it. This is Tom Velas, who was in the breakaway, being swept up, and that's the first chance we've got to see the new colours of the Argus Shimano team. They announced their change of sponsorship only yesterday. And so he's now back in the field here, the Dutchman. Uh, one by one, they are sweeping them up here. A lot of anxious faces now because we've gone over the Steenberg Dries. The next climb comes 210 kilometers from the finish, and that uh, 210 kilometers into the race, or the 47 from the finish, and that's the Kreisberg. Well, BMC racing in the red and black jerseys are being very, very attentive, trying to pick up the pace, trying to pull back that leading group of riders. It's down to a minute and 24 seconds, their advantage, and uh, they're all thinking about the next climb of the day, which will be looming up in front of them, and that will be the Kreisberg, followed very, very quickly by the Eau de Quaremont. And I feel certain, Phil, that uh, somebody will try and use the Eau de Quaremont as a, le a leapfrog to victory. In second position in the blue, white and red jersey, the Tricolore of France is the French national champion, Sylvain Chavanel, who himself is in great form after a recent victory in the three days of La Panna. Yes, yeah, so we're coming into the last 57 kilometres, which is 36 miles of racing left to go now. And they've still got the two ascents of the old Quaremont as well. This peloton is really taking some pounding just now as riders try desperately to get off the front, bring that this breakaway of 10 riders and then concentrate themselves. This looks as though Tommy Voikler is putting himself on. He's also been off the bike with a flat tyre today. Well, the Tour of Flanders, Phil, at the end of the day, when you go down to the showers, the stories are stories. There are so many of them. Everybody usually has a little bit of bad luck during the Tour of Flanders, but you hope it's not going to be a, an accident which is uh, too difficult to get over, like the one we've just seen happen to Fabian Cancellara, and everybody fights back into the race at some time or another. Sitting in second position there is Hed Stegemans, the teammate, of course, of Tom Bonin, a little bit further back, the rider from Garmin Barracuda in the pale blue helmet. He is Johan van Summeren, the winner previously of, of course, the great Paris-Roubaix Classic, and that was a bit of a shock to one or two of us 12 months ago. It most certainly was, and I think there wasn't a dry eye in the house because he's such a popular helper as a rider, uh, never a winner normally, and then he had his big day on Paris-Roubaix, which, uh, let me take an immediate remind you of, we'll be showing you Paris-Roubaix live next Sunday here on NBC Sports, so enjoy that. Uh, right now, this is a classic Tour of Flanders. The peloton is really very, very tenacious today. There's been a lot of problems in that peloton, but they keep fighting back and uh, pushing the pace at the front. And it's not the favourites who are appearing in our television cameras at the moment. Well, not yet, but it certainly will be a little later on. The inimitable style there in the green jersey of Europe car, that is Thomas Vokler on two occasions in his career. He's been aware of the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. I have to say that last year was his best ever performance, finishing in fourth place overall. He was oh so close to getting onto the podium. He's a very aggressive bike rider. Now, if you've got a, a book which indicates you the tactics that you need to adopt in a professional bike race, throw that away, and that is the way that Thomas Vokler races. He races with his gut he races with instinct he does indeed he's never had a top 10 finish in these uh, Belgian classic races before but he has had a 10th place finish in Liège Baston Liège but that's a hilly classic that's due in a couple of weeks time and more likely to suit his style of racing but he is one of those riders he often says that the riders in the peloton don't like me and the reason they don't like him is because he annoys them with attacks like this well, you see him there just playing with his ear. That That's because all of these riders have got race radios in. They're getting all of the information possible fed up to them from their team managers in the race cars behind. Most of the team managers, Phil, don't actually uh, drive the car in a race like this. Because it's live on television, the team managers will be in the passenger seat. And, of course, they will be watching the same images that we are watching now. Well, he's just playing around with his little earpiece there, which means he can talk back to the team car. 
but he's not going very far now. He would dearly like one or two riders to perhaps come forward and join in with him and see what they can do. The gap is coming down. 61 seconds. That was once the gap Lance Armstrong won the Tour de France back in 2003. But he's gone down to a minute now as the peloton string out that long, long line of riders on another tight turn. Well, we're about eight kilometres, five miles from the next big climb of the day. That's Krausberg, and then after that it will be the Eau de Quaremont. Well, it looks as though little Tommy Vokler is about to get caught here as the field sweep up behind him. So they're all together again in the peloton, and the gap is just inside a minute for the first time now. It was nearly six. The field is lining up. So as they go, remember, you're watching the epic series presented by Michelob Ultra. Well, this is the town of Ronsa now at 51 kilometers or 32 miles from the finish here. There's still a number of teams all throwing the weight behind, attack after attack, but there's no formal working at the front. No, there's no organized chase in the main peloton. It's a question of nervousness, I think, on everybody's shoulders. Uh, this is what it's like racing in Belgium. You have to be very alert, very attent, because when you go around any corner, there could be some rather dangerous traffic furniture. Those guys on the left-hand side, they're going to have to ride an awful long time to get themselves back into the peloton, because that's a very high curb to have to negotiate. As they come up one side, they're losing place in the peloton here as they continue to chase. The gap is now down to 50 seconds. 
as that breakaway, which went away very early on today as we went out around the countryside. Here's Tom Bonin. First time he's seen him for a while, number 21, just in front of number 108 there, which is Luca, Luca Paolini, who's also a very good sprinter. If he gets down to it, he may have a problem with the last couple of times up the old Quaramotto. Well, we're inside now, 31 miles to go to the finish, and there are still six climbs left here in the Ronde van Vlaanderen, as they call it here, the Tour of Flanders, and the next climb on the agenda in about three miles' time will be the Kreisberg. It's a fairly easy climb. It's the climb that comes after that, Phil, that everyone else will start to fear, and at 36 kilometres to go, or 24 miles of racing left, the older Quaramolo riders will ascend for the second time here this afternoon. So the field here trying to organise a reaction to the group of 50 seconds. We've still no update on the condition of Fabian Cancellara, who crashed in the feeding station as some 38 miles from the finishing line, except he has been taken to hospital with his injuries. The peloton is actually falling back here with no organised pursuit. 54 seconds now as we get on to the climb of the Kreisberg. And the Kreisberg is hill number 11, and Tyler Farrer there is the man in blue, sat in third position. First time I've seen him actually grimace. He's looked very, very cool all day, Tyler Farrer. Well, the American sprinter on the Bar Garmin Barracuda team, Phil, has actually looked very comfortable on a lot of these climbs. Uh, he was it was suggested to him by the team management, look for the early breakaway here this morning. This is Tor Hussoft on the front now there in the uh, jersey of uh, BMC Racing, the black and red jersey, former world uh, road racing champion. I think today he will be sacrificing his own chances for maybe uh, Philippe Gilbert, the Belgian national champion, or why not Greg Van Avermaet? This looks like uh, Hassan Basayev who's making a move here for Astana. And uh, it looks as I thought he wanted to get away to have his lunch in peace, but he's put that in his back pocket now as he tries to open up a bit of a gap. Well, this is a fairly long climb they're looking at here, but it's not a cobble climb like some of the other climbs that the riders will face up to here this afternoon. It's a long, smooth surface climb at 2.5 kilometres long, and that's just around about one and a half miles. But look at the chaos, which is the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Over on the left-hand side there, you can see the Lion of Flanders and the main field for the first time filling yeah. this very long straightaway. Get a sight of what they've been chasing since the very early part of this race, the survivors of that early morning 15-man breakaway. Well, we're now deep in the heart of Flanders here in Belgium. This is Ronsa, and this is an area which is famous for its post-race uh, circuit races after the Tour de France in the month of July. Basseyev tried to be the first to bridge the gap. As Paul has said, that breakaway, once 15 strong, has been ahead virtually all day today. In the first hour, they covered 30 miles. In the second hour, it's 26 miles, so they've got an average speed of 28 miles for the, an hour for the first two hours of racing. Well, this is now, Tom this Bonin. Is Bonin. This is Bonin at the back of the group here. He's just uh, getting a little bit of grease onto those uh, tire, those uh, that chain of his there. The mechanic wants to make everything certain, everything right before we come to the final climbs of the day. He doesn't look like a man in difficulty. He's always been uh, alongside one of his teammates, either Herd Stegermans or the other teammate who is an extremely strong bike rider, Stein Vandenberg. They've been looking after him as we continue to see Bazaev taking a slight advantage at the front end of the pack. He's about to get joined here by the Frenchman, Anthony Jeslin. Yeah, Jeslin comes up very smoothly there. I would be a bit concerned. We've seen all of the favourites at some stage or other today at the back of the race. And you can see how much the peloton is blocking the road. This is a wide section of the course, but very shortly we're back onto the very narrow, dangerous roads. And if you're caught at the back of the peloton at that time, you can so easily be split off by a fall in the middle and you're left literally walking up the climb and your race is over. Well, this is probably the only climb, I would say, of the day, Phil, where you don't need to panic, but panic may well be the alarm bells ringing when you see the champion of Belgium coming to the front, the man who won the opening stage of the Tour de France last year, and that, of course, Philippe Gilbert in the black, yellow and red jersey. He may well ha hail from the French-speaking part of this country. He does speak Flemish, speaks extremely good English, and he may well be trying the act here today to unify this country, which for many, many years has been separated into two by politics, and, of course, by language. Well, this year, or last year, rather, he finished ninth in this event, the Tour de France, having just finished third in Milan San Remo. But then started a fantastic year for him. In all, he ended the year with 23 victories. And it was an incredible performance by the man from Belgium. BMC quickly signed him up and took him. 
And now he rides alongside Cadell Evans in the upcoming Tour de France. Remember that Cadell Evans, the BMC, is the defending champion in the Tour in July. This is actually a dangerous little move because uh, sneaking into this move once again, Thomas Vokler there in the green jersey in second position. A real uh, concerted effort was made there by the champion of Belgium, Philippe Gilbert, but also getting into this group because they've lost a man. In fact, uh, Team Radio Shack have replaced a rider in the move here by Jaroslav Popovic. Now, this is the kind of race that would suit a man like Popovic. And this is the point I was making, Paul, because Tom Bonin was caught at the back of this peloton doing his bit with the team car and Gilbert has gone off the front and opened up a gap and now it's a lot of work required for Bonin to get back into the action. Yes it is but I think he's a man who knows exactly how he wants to ride his race. Look at the fact there's not one quick step rider in this group at all. They're all in the group behind they're looking after the interests of Tom Bonin I noticed a quick step rider coming to the front end of the main field to lift up the pacemaking and slowly pull it back to this group well, there's a face of Philippe Gilbert, the champion of Belgium, knowing that maybe his form isn't as good as it was at this stage last year, but this is Belgium, and this is their biggest day out as far as any sport is concerned in this country. This is their one day of action, and they don't like it if a Belgian cyclist doesn't win this event. So, a chasing group trying to establish. We'll take another break. Rejoin us very shortly. Welcome back to the Tour de Flanders, we're live, there's 46 kilometres to go, that's about 26 miles left to the finish here, and the breakaway, literally, as you rejoin us, has been caught by the field. David Bouchier here, the Frenchman, is still trying to stay away. He's been in the original break of 15 riders, but there is the coming together of the field. Well, the field now realise that the Tour of Flanders is getting underway. They've got two more ascents of the famous climb 
of the older Quaramont. Many years gone past, I always said the race doesn't start till it gets to the old Quaramont. Well, this year, Phil, they've probably got three starts because they're going over the old Quaramont three times in this event here this afternoon. Two more times to go. A little bit of respite here for the main field as the two groups join together. A little bit of a, a lull in the action before they then start to line themselves up because there's only six miles separates the top of the Kreisberg, of course, from the old Quaramont. And that's where we're bound for now. The road becomes extremely narrow. It's a cobble climb. It twists and turns. And the last time we went round it, before we came on air, a lot of the peloton were forced to walk the climb. By the way, the street they're coming into now is known as the Ronde van Vlaanderenstraat, or the Tour of Flanders Street, named after this very famous road. It comes along this road uh, in both ways uh, here this afternoon. They're coming this way, they'll drop down into the small town of Kreisbergen along the bottom of this ridge, which this year the Tour of Flanders is zigzagging its way up and down this way and that to make this a very tough edition. I think probably one of the most nervous editions we've probably ever witnessed. Johan van Sommeren here to the right. He's now on his new team of Garmin Barracuda. He's taking on a late afternoon tea before the famous Quadermont comes his way. Incidentally, the Belgian riders have won this event 67 times out of a possible 94, uh, 95 rather. Uh, so they've dominated it in many, many ways. They don't like losing this race. And so be sure to see them under pressure as we get to the Quadermont this time around. Well, uh, Boucher, the rider in the front there from uh, FDG, uh, the French team, is in fact uh, from not too far away from here because he was born in the small town of Fourmi, which is just over the border, not too far away from here. Another small group trying to prize an advantage over the front end of the peloton, but they're not being allowed any freedom at all as Team Sky in the white jerseys with the blue strip right down the middle there pulls the race back together. They're obviously thinking about the possibility of a victory for one of their riders this afternoon, Edvold Bosenhagen or Juan Antonio Fletcher. But maybe the dark horse on their squad could be the man called Bernard Eisel, the Austrian rider. Yes, Eisel would, uh, is quite likely to spring a surprise. The Austrian is a very affable character, but this rider is trying to ride them all off. It's a hopeless task, I'm afraid. David Boucher, he's been in the breakaway of 15s almost since the flag was dropped. And he's the sole survivor now. The flag of Norway there waving for two riders, Boysenhagen and also for Tor Hushop. Both riders last year winning two stages each in the Tour de France. So Norway don't have many big cyclists, but these two are particularly good. And they're both in that field at the moment. Coming up on the outside now, the Dutch riders for Rabobank also moving their men forward. Lars Bohm's been very, very active on that squad. Meanwhile, back in the field here, this is Kuzinski of Katusha. The field is regrouping. The battle is about to recommence. We'll take another break. Rejoin us. Oh, 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 oh.
Well, we're looking down there very, very briefly on an accident which has just happened to Sebastian Langeveld of the Australian Green Edge team. He's collided with a spectator. The breakaway remains the same, although not for much longer. This is David Bouchier out in front, and the peloton now massing right behind him. Now, if we can have a flashback here to what happened on that crash, you can see the speeding down the street here. A couple of riders going down the pavement, and they catch a spectator marooned in the middle. He tries to get out of it, and his front wheel goes into the front leg, rather, goes into the wheel of Sebastian Langeveld, and Langeveld's wheel is ripped out, and he takes a very, very heavy fall indeed. These accidents, Paul, that they're so easy and so quick to mature, aren't they? Well, all I can say as a, as a piece of advice to any spectator is do not move, because nine times out of ten, the bike rider will miss you. They're extremely good at bike handling, uh, but if, the, if they've got a moving target in front of them, it's very difficult to decide what line they need to take. In the main field, though, Phil, they really are starting to whip up the pace. It is the final couple of kilometres as we get ourselves to the start of the old Quaramont, and that's uh, Frédéric Guédon sitting on the front end of the main field in that white jersey for FDJ he's a very experienced rider what he's trying to do Phil is get into the, the narrow streets to slow down the pacemaker at the front end of the peloton hoping his teammate will get a couple more seconds advantage and Guedon here in the Tour of Flanders uh, will retire from the sport and next week in the Paris-Roubaix race which we will also show you live uh, he's coming back from injury himself but determined to uh, retire in a race he once won which will be next week in France and there he is looking over his shoulder here as Garmin Barracuda the American boys move up on the outside that's their Australian team member Heinrich Hausler uh, twitchy looking around now we're getting down to the narrow road remember we are racing towards the second climb of the old Quaramont climb and that's the end of David Bouchier now we're all together 24 and a half miles to go and it's bye bye from David Bouchier who's been in the breakaway all day thus far and he's caught 25 miles from the end. Well, we talked, as I said earlier in the day, Phil, to Jonathan Vaught, as it seems as if his tactics are unfolding perfectly for the moment, because having had his man in the breakaway, Tyler Farah, he was in the break of 15 men for a long time. His team didn't have to do any chasing. We now start the old Aquaramont for the second time. The third-place rider in uh, Team Garmin Barracuda there is Heinrich Hausler, and he's looking after the pre-race favourite from that American squad, and that, of course, is Sepp van Mark. Picking up a nice tailwind on the cobbles of the old Quaramont at the moment here. The spectator, there's no room on the road to stand at all, as you can see. And the riders haven't really got a smooth edge to these cobblestones. They've got to battle and bounce their way up to the summit. The art of riding these is fast, as fast as you can, and hope that you splinter the field. Well, you might have said uh, Tom Bonham was riding at the back end of the peloton, but when it's important, here he comes in third position there. He's moved himself up in that pale blue jersey. He knows where to be at the right time in a race like the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Right in front of him is a former winner of this race, Alessandro Balan, also on the American squad at BMC Racing. He too knows the importance of riding at the right place at the right time in an event like the Tour of Flanders. I'd be a little concerned about Balan too. He's one of only two riders, the other being Fabian Cancellara, to have beaten the Belgians at their own game in this event in the last 10 years. And he's the, uh, as Paul says, the former champion of Spain. He's second position at the moment. Bonin is in third position. Perfectly poised now. Boysenhagen is trying to move back up to the front as well. Now, if our camera holds this picture, you might see one or two rides at the back really in a spot of bother. Well, it is a tough climb, this. Uh, it starts off with a smooth surface, then all of a sudden it kicks up. I just noticed George Hinkabi going through there. I have to say, Tom Bonin in third position, Phil, is looking very comfortable. He really likes these cobble climbs. He knows how to ride them. You have to keep your hands nice and soft and in the middle of the handlebars, allowing the bike to find its own way over at the smoothest possible route that you can attain. Well, the organisers have finally got the crowd into order here on the old Quaramont now, and they've given those what road they can to the riders. There is Hincapi uh, in the race, uh, looking for his 17th finish. Uh, uh, Tom Bone and his head twitching in that light blue jersey to see who is making the moves. And in fact, it's Sylvain Chavanel who's made the move and he's gone forward. Tomica is the man, but Chavanel is the distraction. They're on the same team. Well, that's the uh, French national champion there, Phil, in the red, white and blue. And they've got this cordoned off like an arena here this afternoon. And these are the gladiators of the Tour of Flanders this afternoon. I think the nod went down there from Tom Boonen to his teammate Sylvain Chavanel. 
put the hammer down, my man, because we're now inside of 24 miles to go to the finish of this bike race, and there are still four nasty climbs to go. Once they've summited here, the old Quartermont for the penultimate time fill, they drop down and they go over the Paterberg, and that's the kind of climb that Tom Bonin really appreciates. Short, sharp, and steep. Last year, it was Fabian Cancellara who caused all of the problems here. Sylvain Chavanel took advantage of that. He crossed the line in second place, while Tom Bonin had to be content with a fourth-place finish and off the podium. Today, it looks to me as though Chavanel is repaying Tom Bonin, and he's doing the brunt of the work at the front. Look at the damage to the peloton as we come up towards the top of the Quaramont. He has split the field here with his effort. Well, this is actually the hardest part of the climb because when you're on the steep climb, over on the left-hand side, there's a man we spoke about before the start of this race, Peter Sagan. He is a very good rider, just 22 years of age, but he's riding like the man with the experience of a 30-year-old. And he's on very, very good form. We saw early he's had trouble today. He's been back to the team car. He had to change a bike. He waited 10 kilometres between analysing the problem and changing his bike. He wanted the right place to make a swift change. He did it. He got back into the action without using up too much energy. Well, Chavanel's had a great season. Uh, he's been very omnipresent at the front end of the main field in races like Paris-Nice, but really by winning the individual time trial in the three days of La Pana just recently, only finishing on Thursday and taking the overall victory, that's when it was announced that he would be a co-leader to uh, the squad here of Quick Step uh, team, where you can see Tom Bone riding there in fourth position. I think today, last year, there's a little bit of misunderstanding between them, but now I think with the fact that Tom Bonin has come back to the form that he had two or three years ago, Phil, the team will be all for one on the running towards the finish. But look at oh, the damage Saga. that Chavanel has done. Well, I tell you, look at the first four riders, Paul. They could all be the podium by the end of the race. Chavanel, Sagan, Balas, uh, Alessandro Balan, and then Tom Bonin. Uh, two winners now in the front group of four riders. Well, a little bit of uh, uh, youth and uh, excitement there. He missed that bottle that he wanted to take on board. So, Chavanel continues as he now heads towards the Paderberg, which is a couple of kilometres on. As uh, Bonin still looks very cool there, another danger zone. As we see, the breakaway has gone clear now on the second climb of the old Quanamont, but the Pelamont, Pe Peloton, a bit smaller, but are still in the thick of it. Now, remember, today's special live presentation of the Tour of Flanders is brought to you by Competitive Cyclist. Look at that gap. Bing! That was Shava. Here we go, Paterberg. 
Oh! Oh, damn. Van Sommeren. Oh, this is it. Bonus winning. It's all over. Volpate. Welcome back as you're watching the leaders here now on the climb of the Paterberg. I can tell you it always happens when we go to commercial, I'm afraid, because we had a huge crash again as the peloton turned on. And it looks to me as though it is the fault of Johan van Sommeren here, the boy in black. And that this was a particularly ugly pile-up on a bend as they all go crashing down and blocking the road amongst the other fallers there too, uh, where riders uh, such as Luca Paolini went down. And I think Luca might be in this league group at the moment. I may be wrong about that, Paul. Well, it has caused a certain amount of chaos as we can now start to see the gaps opening seriously. 34 kilometres is all that's left here in this year's uh, Tour of Flanders. And uh, this is a very difficult climb as they go over the summit here of the Paterberg. A difficult climb, a steep climb. Just going round there, uh, Dries Davenens, one of the teammates of the Omega Farmer Lotto uh, duo, I'd have to say, because both Tom Boone and and Sylvain Chavanel Phil have managed to get themselves back into the leading group of riders. Well, there are three riders ahead of the peloton. They got away after we saw that wonderful effort to buy Sylvain Chavanel on the old Quaramont. And uh, one Antonio Flexer to Sky. Now, look, we're going to see that crash again here as they swing on to the crime. It was um, Summer on to the right. He slipped on the side. One rider there from Katusha, I think, went right into the ditch. Caught out in that gap on the right-hand side was uh, one of the pre-race favourites as well, Peter Sagan from Team Liquid Gas Cannondale. Tom Bonham, very attentive. Phil has ridden across the gap here with a teammate, and we're now down to a very select group of riders, just 10 riders strong, with about a five to seven second advantage over the front end of the pack. Riders scrabbling across all the time here. The breakaway was spearheaded by Juan Antonio Fletcher himself, has been off the back with bicycle problems today. His team got him back on. The sprinter Luca Paolini from Katusha and Vincent Jerome, who is one of the young French hopes. Uh, they talk about him with glowing pride for the way he will develop into being a good bike rider. This is Paolini on the right of our picture now. The breakaway is growing. Ah, but Sepp van Mark is in here from uh, Garmin Barracuda. Tom Bonin is in here as well. He's got a teammate alongside him in the form of the French national champion, Sylvain Chavanel. This could well be the deciding moment, but van Bonin certainly believes it is. Phil, he's very happy to come to the front and whip up the pacemaking. Well, this has been such a hard-fought race, really. Brakes have been going all of the time, and the one that's going to work, surely, has got to carry a favourite along with him. As we swing around here, trying to get on terms here now at the moment. The rider from Sky, it looks like it might be Ian Stannard, is it? I think it could be Ian Stannard. If it's not Stannard, it's Boysenhagen himself. I can't quite see him saying it's Boysenhagen. And the man we saw stop and uh, was helped by his teammates, Oscar Gatto. He's a very fast sprinter if he can get across the gap to this league group. Well, these guys are organised. I have to say, you can see the French national champion now. This is a this is a head of state breakaway coming off the front end of this pack field. Second position, Alessandro Balan, former winner, former champion of the world. But there are three riders in this leading group from Omega Pharma Quickstep, the new blockhouse team on the block. Yes, and as they continue to set the pace here, it's going to be tough now for anybody to bridge to this gap. We'll go out on our final circuit shortly. We have three more climbs to come. The next one in just a couple of kilometres, coming at, at 32 kilometres, as we are now, 20 miles to go. The other rider in there, Phil, for quick step, in fact, is Nicky Terpstra. So Oscar Gatto and Edouard Boysenhagen trying to cross the gap now at the moment. So the crunch moment has come in this year's Tour of Flanders. We'll take a break.
and we are now on the Holgerberg, the third climb from the finish, and we're about uh, 19 miles to go. Those two riders of Gatto and uh, Boysenhagen have not crossed the gap in the far distance, what is left of the peloton, but what we do have now are 11 riders, Paul, and in this breakaway, three of the five men we projected as favourites at the head of the programme are here. Sadly, Cancellara out with a crash, and Gilbert has missed the move. Well, Gilbert may have missed the move, but he has a teammate in the breakaway. That's the rider just on the left-hand side. This is Bosenhagen. He's been pull pulled back into the main field. But all of the damage, I have to be say, Phil, has been done by the team we've regarded this year as being a mega team. It was brought together by the formation of the Omega Farmer riders from the Lotto squad last year and the Quick Step riders making this massive big team. They are strategically in the best position possible here this afternoon because they've got three riders in that leading group of 11. The three riders they've got is their pre-race favourite, Tom Bonin, the champion of France, Sylvain Chavanel, and the former champion of Holland, Nicky Sturpstra. They're going to have to do something very special to beat these guys today. And I must say, the team of Patrick Lefebvre, this wily old Belgian, is vastly experienced. He's seen big teams come, big teams go. He's always steered a winning course with the team he's been in control of. And he has the firepower up here now with three riders on the Amiga Quick Step team. If I have a little bit of a move here to try and get away, this will be Vincent Giron, who is the young upstart on the French squads and they're holding big court for him for the future. Well, uh, Europe car and French cycling is uh, in a bit of a renaissance in the last uh, 24 months. They rode exceptionally well in the Tour de France last year, probably the best tour that they have actually performed in the last five years for the French, and they've got a lot of young blood on the way up. Yes, Thomas Vogler is the man who wears the flag. Uh, he's the darling of France, but now under his wing, he's managed to bring to the top of the sport a lot of young riders who are now not scared of the reputations of the tough Flanderins, like this young man here, Vincent Jérôme, you can just see that flag flying there is no longer the Lion of Flanders. In fact, that is the flag of the Wallonie. And that will be flying very high here this afternoon for physique, Philippe Gilbert. He's not made the split here this afternoon, but his teammate Alessandro Balan from the American team BMC Racing is comfortably in this group of 11. Number 121 there, Phil. I have to take my hat off to him. The rider from Liquid Gas was slowed down by that crash at the bottom of the Paterberg, but he was still in the leading group once they went over the top of the climb. Well, he managed to get the split. It was a difficult split. He wasn't in the initial move. The initial move came from Fletcher, Paolini and Jerome himself. And the others scrambled across the gap after they came over the top of the last climb at Peterberg. Now, Jerome is causing consternation here. But what he is doing, Paul, he's keeping the momentum of this breakaway to pull clear of the field. I can't see who is left to bring these riders back to the fold. It's an ideal situation. There are a lot of big names there. They all feel they've got their chance in a group like this. They will be, though, Phil, a little concerned about the fact that uh, Omega Pharma Quickstep are very strong with three riders out of 11. This is not a bad situation for the breakaway either because it's almost like the uh, carrot ahead of the donkey. They will keep themselves uh, encouraged to work together to make sure this Frenchman doesn't steal an advantage of 10 seconds build it up to 20 and then 30 seconds and then put them into danger and being in a situation of not being able to pull him back before the finish. Luca Paolini just gone off our picture to the left. He looks over, sees big Tom Bone and come through. The crowd here in Belgium will be cheering all the way while their hot favourite Tom Bone is there. Well, if they have gone, they've gone, but that race down there tells me they haven't let them go yet. 17 seconds, a long, thin line of riders here, puffing and blowing at the front as they try to bring it all back together. This is Bernie Eisel on the front. Bernie Eisel now will not be riding for himself. The fact that uh, the uh, rider Bosenhagen didn't get across the gap, Phil, I think, is why all of a sudden we've seen the pressure coming to the front, because Bosenhagen is the big leader this year for Team Sky Pro Cycling. A little bit of a strange tactic, though, because Juan Antonio Fletcher is in the group, but maybe he sent the message back to his teammates behind. My legs are not that great here this afternoon. I was only in this breakaway to look after the man whose nickname is the Bodog from Norway. Well, four years ago, Fletcher did finish on the podium in this event when we finished in Mayer Becker, and he was third then. And this is good to see a French rider on the attack. The French do not feature well in this event over the years. But right now, uh, 
Jerome is riding extremely strongly. This is a little bit of a dangerous move, though, because although Nicky Terpstra has got an advantage, jumping straight across the gap is Sepp van Mark. Now, he is the man who, at the start of the day, was the Garmin Barracuda squad's tip for the top, and that's what Jonathan Vaught has told us this morning. They were all riding for this man. Tyler Farrar, the sprinter, had an opportunity to get into the early morning breakaway, but it was all about the man, the youngster, 23 years of age from Belgium, riding on an American squad who was going to ride for himself this afternoon, just scrambling across the gap. You've got Luca Paolini in the red jersey on the Russian Katusha squad, but everybody else now picking up the pacemaking. I'd be worried about Nicky Terpster. He's bang on top of his form. Not very far away from where we're commentating here in Odenard is the town of De Panna, which is on the Belgian coast. And last week, Terpster finished fourth in their uh, small stage race there. So he's got good form. He's had a win as well. Probably having one of his best starts to a new season. But they're not having any of it here. Look at the work being done by Fletcher in the black as he dra drags the rest of the breakaway across. All of this infighting is going to pull them out a bigger lead over the chase. Well, there's a group at 16 seconds in the main field, are 44 seconds behind, but they're stretched out into a very long line. This race fill this afternoon is far from over. 16 seconds is the gap now. At that group number two, I think, is still Gatto, uh, but Gatto himself now has gone back into the field. 16 seconds, the spread to the whole of the contenders now. We will take another break at 15 miles to go.
So that's a great coverage of Paris Bay. It's live, of course, and all of these riders coming together again to do battle. Not very far away from where we are today. This is the biggest race in Belgium. Paris Bay is the biggest one day race in France. They are scrambling here, Paul. They're racing to keep the pressure on. Do you think this is the winning move? I'm pretty certain this is the winning move of riders because you've got all the big names, sure? but as I say that right behind, <laughs> they're boring down upon them. They've still got about a 40-second advantage, and I really can't understand why this race is not riding away. Nicky Sturpstra, the former champion of Holland, he's putting this, the pedal to the metal here this afternoon, trying to drag this group clear, and they're hoping that they're going to survive to the next uh, climb, which will be the climb of the old Quadramont for the last time, but that's still four miles to go. And as we look here at Team Sky, and they've done the damage to close this down, to bring Boyce and Hagen back into the accident. Uh, news coming from the camp of Fabian Cancellara from Trek Bikes is that he has broken his collarbone, uh, and that's the only update we have had since we saw that crash, which came uh, in the feeding station with about 38 miles to race. Poor Fabian today out of the Tour de Flanders. Nicky Terps are here, former champion of Holland, though, trying to drive away to a lone win. Remember, we are now racing for the third and final climb of the old Quaramont. Well, Nicky Terpstra may well be the, the surprise move here by Team Omega Pharma Quickstep. Uh, he ridden very well in the early part of this season. As you've mentioned, Phil, he was fourth overall in the three days of La Panna, but he was also the winner of the race across Flanders, the Doise d'Or Vlaanderen. But Team Sky have got themselves organised. Oh. They're in a pretty impressive situation, too, because they've got Juan Antonio Fletcher in the breakaway. That was uh, Bernie Eisel doing the big turn. He's now allowing Christian Kniss to do the pacemaking on the front, and they have done a great job of pulling that gap back from 45 seconds to inside of the half a minute margin now. The pressure is on Team Sky to do something next time we come to the Quadramont. It is all down to Sky to repair the damage. They didn't have the man they wanted in the breakaway. They had one Antonio Fletcher up there. He must have said, uh, let's uh, bring this back together again. It's still Vincent who's trying to get away here. Vincent Durand. As he still joins up with Terpstra, but he keeps checking, he flick of his elbow there, that's to say, come on through and set the pace, but I think Terpstra has about reached his limit. Well, I'm sorry I predicted this to be the winning breakaway because I was the bringer of doom on that breakaway here this afternoon because the main field, led by the Team Sky charge here, is about to all come back together. Apart from the lone two who managed to get off the front of the main field, I don't expect that Tom Boonen and his riders from Omega Pharma Quickstep expected to see the main peloton again today. Well, we are only 12 and a bit miles from the finish of the Tour of Flanders and the whole peloton, the peloton that's left in this race, have rejoined at the front. But it is still Terpstra and uh, Jerome who are trying to stay away in the confusion. Well, jumping across the gap there, you've got Team Sky making sure that that move doesn't go clear again. Sylvain Chevenel in third position in the French red, white and blue jersey. He is attentive. Juan Antonio Fletcher knows not to let anybody get away at a time like this, especially after the work that's been done by the teammates. Well, there's the information as we start our third and final circuit here, as the riders now head out to the old Quaramont for the last time. Luca Paolini at the front. The two riders are just about to be caught here. 20 kilometres or 12 miles to the finish, and I'm pretty sure the peloton is going to be all together any moment now.
and as the riders hit the old Quaramant now for the last time, they caught those two leaders, and it is the former world champion, Alessandro Balan of the American BMC team, who has gone clear alone. Well, he's taken the initiative, Phil, of putting the hammer down, and he's now starting to get himself onto the hardest part of this climb. Well, I think it's the hardest part of this climb. It's the false flat after the steep start to the old Quaramont. Look at the crowds on the left and right-hand side of the road. Tom Bonin is on the front end of the main field, but he's always covered by Pippa Pozzato in that lime green jersey on the left, or by uh, P uh, Peter Sagan in the lime green jersey of Team Liquid Gas Cannondale. They're now starting to open up the gap, but we're now inside of 10 miles to go to the finish. And again, the gaps are forming on the climb here, but this is the last time up this hill, but it's very swiftly followed in just two miles by the last climb of the race, the Peterberg, and then it's everybody for themselves, eyes down in the run into Udenard and the finish. This is a perfect move by Alessandro Balan today. They've had a lot of big riders on BMC and they've played all of their cards and Balan has watched and watched and waited. And the result is now he's always planned to give it all his strength on the last climb of the old Quaramont. Well, he's a man who hasn't won a professional bike race, Phil, since 2009 when he won a small race in Belgium, as it happens back in August. But he's now decided to take the to put the bit between his teeth and put the pressure down. But he's being chased by another Italian. This is Pippo Pozzato, a former teammate of Tom Bonin. And look at the gap. They are starting to open now on the false flat of the old Aquarimol straight across that gap as if it was absolutely nothing indeed. In fact, we're now looking at a three-man breakaway as they get towards the top here. Tornado Tom Fritsches. Yes, I'm sure that tonight Tom Bonin will be having a big plate of Belgian fries if he can get himself the victory in a race like this. They're on the last few hectometers of the old Quaramont, a bit of a flat road, then down into the descent, and it's over the Paterbergville, which is the last climb of the day. The act of Olgas, the chases, and they're being led here by Luca Paolini as he tries now to close down the gap. Uh, but they may have let the three strongest riders slip away here and come together on the very last climb of the old Paramount. I saw the face of Tom Bonin halfway up the climb. He was gritting his teeth and was not enjoying the climb at all. But he's found his strength somewhere to cross that gap to Balan. Well, that's what he was looking to do. He sat on the wheel. He's got the advantage tactically here because in this crew behind, he's got uh, two or three teammates, of course, still in there all of the time. Sylvain Chavanel, he will sit there. He'll be comfortable in his armchair ride with all of those other riders doing the pacemaking. If they catch this leading group, watch out for the counter-attack to come from Sylvain Chavanel, the French national champion. This has been such a difficult race to lead. You've had to be strong throughout the day to marshal every move because each breakaway that's gone has looked likely to succeed. Now, three top names have moved clear, Pizzato, Bonin and Balan. Balan and Bonin have won this race three times between them. And remember, if Tom Bonin does win today, then he joins the all-time greats, one of only five men who will have won this race on three occasions. Luca Paolini is the Italian rider on the Russian Katusha squad. He knows this is crunch time in the Tour of Flanders here this afternoon. He can almost see those three riders in front of them. That's why he's trying to ride across the gap. While you can see there, Sylvain Chavanel makes sure that one rider doesn't get halfway across the gap. But it looks to me, Phyllis, that the firepower is disappearing from that group behind. The legs now are starting to cry out for a little bit of a surrender, a little bit of respite as the Tour of Flanders gets harder and harder. Well, I've never seen a Luca Paolini ride so well for years, but he's now looking as though he's being left to go on alone here as they continue to snatch bottles on the way. Balan is charging. Now Pazzato Filippo is in second wheel here. He broke his collarbone in the Tour of Qatar, which was in the month of February. He's built on that since he's finished sixth in Milan San Remo. The other week he was ninth in the semi-Belgian classic between Ghent and Wavelgum. And now he's got into what might be the winning move here. As we're seeing, pa Paolini has had to go it alone. Ten miles to go to the finish, and this little Italian sprinter needs to get to the front to use it. Well, that's what he's thinking of doing. He wants to get himself across the gap. This is a hard thing to do, to get halfway across a gap, because he's using a lot of firepower, a lot of energy, Phil, trying to get across this gap. Then all of a sudden, he's going to take a turn onto the start of the Paterberg, and that really hurts. The difference in pedalling style between the fast pedalling on these little downhill parts of the road, then the climb of the Paterberg could be the undoing of Paolini, but he's halfway across the gap and Pippo Pozzato is still prepared to help with the pacemaking. We are not far from the actual climb of the Paderberg now, which is the springboard to the finish. 
as they continue. The last Italian rider to win this uh, was indeed Alessandro Bilan back in 2007. Is he going to repeat it today? Well, he's going to hope that he can. Pippo Pozzato has finished fifth place overall in this race before, and he's also a very astute tactician. But the impetus appears to have disappeared there. Halfway across the gap, it's still Paolini trying to make the junction. Bonin realises, Phil, at a time like this, he's got to keep working. He's got to make sure that they conserve that advantage. When they go over the top of the final climb of the day, the Paterberg, there are just seven and a half miles of racing left to go to the finish. But it's not an easy seven and a half miles. And in fact, as many of the experts from Belgium said, it could be the wind at the end of the day that is the tactic that really is the undoing for many of these riders. Because it could be a head crosswind on the run in towards the finish. Onto the slopes of the Paterberg for the last time now. This is Balan keeping up the tempo he found on the old Quaramont. Tom Bonham following pretty coolly in second wheel. Pazzato, he might be the weakest, weakest of these three riders. This is the last climb of this year's Tour de Flanders, the 16th of a real aggressive day of bike racing. Can Paolini cross that gap on the cobbles? Well, we've got a Belgian here in an Italian sandwich this afternoon because on the front it's Alessandro Bilan in third position, Pippo Pozzato. These are the riders now who are trying to steal the advantage. You can see just halfway across the gap is Paolini, but it's Peter Sagan who's doing the majority of the pacemaking in that group behind. Amazing to think, Phil, he's still in with a chance of a win at just 22 years of age. Strong men will see this as their last chance now to cross from that chase to these three leaders. And these three leaders know that, believe me. And Bonin, like he was on the old Quaramont, is lacking a little bit here. He's finding the pressure just a bit too much he, as the race is being chased up by Pazzato at the front. Well, he's under pressure, Bonin. He's controlling himself. He's trying to stay in contact. He's lost himself a bike length, a bike length and a half, but he goes round the top here. He'll recover very quickly. He'll sprint, he'll accelerate, he'll dig deep into those reserves to make contact once again with those two Italians in front of him. Well, a fifth-place finish back in 2009 is the best finish for Filippo Pazzato, and he looked to be the best man on that climb as they continue now to break up from the chase group. This is Sagan, his last moments to cross the gap and become a young winner of this event, and he will come from a country that has never won this race before. Well, there's a lot of tension now in the running towards the finish because it undulates now. Tom Bonin will be happy to have survived the Paterberg fill for the last time, but now what's he going to do? He's got to get his sprinting mind back in, but he's got to work with these two Italian riders with him because the gap was only 18 seconds as they went over the top of the Paterberg, looking back here, sweeping to try and get an estimation of what the time gap is. There you can see halfway across the gap, I would expect that would be Peter Sagan trying to come back into this race. Well, this is Sagan trying to cross the gap now. Desperate moments through the narrow roads of the wooded countryside here in Flanders as they race now for the finish. This is Balan, followed by Tom Bonin and Pizzato. And if it goes down to the line with these three, it's not a foregone conclusion for the sprinter Tom Bonin because Pizzato packs a punch in the sprint, as does this man if he gets across. So as we race through these very, very narrow streets here now, can the champion of Slovakia put himself back on stage here and make it four men for the finish? Well, we're just about eight and a half miles to go. We'll have to take one final break, but when we come back, we'll be there to the finish.
and we're back and it's every man for himself now in the Tour de Flanders we're getting down to the last six miles to go this is Peter Saga but he's being swept up here by a group and that there's still those three riders out in front well, the three riders in front uh, certainly have set the race on fire here this afternoon. Big names as well. Pippo Pozzato is the man with lots of firepower. Former winner of this race, Alessandro Balan. Former two-time winner of this race, Tom Bonin. Halfway across the gap, Peter Sagan, at 22 years of age, was trying to close it all down. But the three leaders, with just six miles to go, hold on to an advantage of 25 seconds. And no one is shirking any of the pacemaking in this leading group of three, and they have to work this downfield all the way down to the line if they want to survive. There are no more hills. That is the gap, which is getting itself reorganised again. The cream certainly has risen to the top but with nine kilometres or five and a bit miles to go, there's time for it to go sour. This is Peter Sagan. He refuses to give up. Paolini's gone into the back of the chase group. He was up the road, he's come back. We've still got Jerome here. We've got also Sylvain Chavanel. We have a great ride being done by the New Zealand rider, Hayden Rolston, as well. There he is, just dropping down in the black top to his jersey. He's done well to read this breakaway. Well, Quickstep and BMC Racing are in a very good position tactically because that rider from BMC Racing, the American team, was uh, Greg Van Avermaet himself, a very fast finisher. He will sit there and hope that they don't get caught and lead up the lead the charge for a victory to his own teammate as we start to see now the acceleration and this in fact is a, a Kiwi rider on Radio Shack Nissan Trek Hayden Rolston a former brilliant track rider doesn't look as if these riders are really putting the hammer down but the clock is what's telling us the truth it's almost half a minute that corresponds to around about 500 yards advantage over the chasers Eight kilometres or five miles left to go. The chief referee on the left of our picture there now in the prime position to see what is happening behind. If those riders come close, he will move those cars so they don't leapfrog across to the leaders. Tom Bonin, he's only here now, I think, Paul, because he's Belgian. He's too proud, but I think he's absolutely shattered. He has really been put under pressure by the attacks of these two Italians. First of all, by the attack of Alessandro Berlin. Then by the acceleration of the man in the lime green jersey on the right-hand side there, Pippo Pozzato. And yes, not only is he Belgian, Phil, but he's Flemish. And that's what this bike race is all about. It's yeah. about the Flanders, the Vlaanderen, and that's why they've all turned out today. Almost three-quarters of a million people have lined the streets of the Flanders here this afternoon with one hope, one desire in mind, to see a Belgian winner. And the name they all uttered this morning was Tomica, and that's his nickname for Boonen. Well, the Belgians have won this race, as I said earlier, 67 times and there was a period between 1924 and 1948 they were never beaten 25 straight years the Italians in contrast have won this race only 10 times and now the odds are 2 to 1 against Bonin well, that's, uh, that's theoretical, Phil, but I would say it's a 50-50 chance for Tom Bonin here this afternoon because he is the man with the fastest finish. He's won on seven occasions so far this year, and I'd have to say not only has his form and strength come back, but his mental has come back, his mental approach, yeah. and that could be sometimes the most more powerful thing when it comes to the end of a bike race like this, especially when you've won it before in the past. Well, we're seeing him today in Flanders live. Remember, we'll see him live again in Paris-Roubaix next week. And he's going to be in the mix again. That's also a race he has won in the past. But right now, Tom Bonin would give all his victories away to win this event for Belgium now. Massive crowds throughout. There's a huge crowd in the new finish in Odenar, which is a long, straight finish. Peter Sagan here has tried his heart out today. Nobody has helped him. And it looks as though he's given up and he's fallen back into the chase. Hats off, though, Phil, because he saw the move. He knew the move that he needed to be with. He could feel the power going out of this group that he was with and said, right, I've got to get across the gap. He took the one last chance that he could to try and get himself to this leading group of three riders. These are serious men. Pozzato in the lime green, in the black and red, Alessandro Balan riding like he hasn't ridden since 2009. And, of course, I'd have to say probably a similar thing for Tom Bonin. He's been dogged by accidents and illness over the last couple of seasons. But this year, he's back to being the man that he was a couple of seasons ago. Now, seven kilometres to go, just under five miles from the finish. The boys here are going to start thinking, how are they going to beat one another? That might cause them to slow a little bit. They can all sprint, and in theory now, for me, the best sprinter will be Pozzato. 
Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that one, Phil, just for a change, because, in fact, for me, the best sprinter is Tom Bonin. He's a great sprinter. He's uh, worn the green jersey in the Tour de France. He's won stages in the Grand Tours. He knows how to sprint, but it's always difficult. When you're in a three-man group, it's not quite the same. There is always the chance that you make a mistake. You lead out a little bit too early. That yep. gap is foreshortened by the camera there because it's now, in fact, almost a one-minute advantage. But these three leaders, they must continue to collaborate. Well, Pazzato doing more than his fair share of work at the moment. Fifth in this event in 2009, sixth the year before that. Uh, he's never been on the podium, though. And Balan and Bonin have both won this event. There is the official five kilometres to go. And we, uh, we agree with that on our GPS right now. 56 seconds at five kilometres to go. In theory, that should be enough. Uh, but will it be? Well, theoretically, they should survive. I think they will survive because I think their guts have been taken out of the chase group behind. If we're talking about the success of professional bike riders here, well, Alessandro Balanville, he's won 12 races throughout his career. Yes, some of them have been huge races. People put Zato in the lime green there. He's won 46 races. Tom Bonin, number 21, he's the most prolific winner in this leading group with 116 victories to his career since he turned professional back in 2002. And that's the man who's grimacing, just passing in and out to the right of our picture now, knowing he's got all the pressure of the day. But let's face it, all week he's had the pressure of the day because the newspapers have been flashing headlines every day about Tomica. Tomica's the affectionate way of speaking in the Flemish language when you're talking about the boy. And Tomica today is on everybody's lips. Five kilometres to go for the chase, and all of a sudden the energy has gone from that group. Three miles of racing is what remains here. Uh, Tomiko Bonin, he's got his teammate, his team manager up alongside him, Wilfred Peters. Peters himself, a seasoned professional rider in the one-day classics, giving him some advice, some last-minute encouragement, just reminding him the pressure of the whole of this nation is on his shoulders here this afternoon. There's probably around about 70% of the television figures in Belgium this afternoon are watching this, these images of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. The makeshift grandstands, they've had a great day out watching the race now. They're still cheering a Belgian hope here in Tom Bonham. He wears the flashes on the ends of his racing jersey sleeves there of a, of a former world champion, which he is, of course. And so too is Alessandro Bolan, who's setting the pace now. These are three of the biggest names in the world of cycling on the biggest one-day race in Belgium. I'm not surprised that Pizzato's team car here is getting pretty excited. It's a new team, really. He joined it this year, Farnese Vini. That means Farnese Wines. And he could be delivering them the biggest result of their lives today if he wins. Well, just down there in the shadows of the Belfry, that's where the finishing line is. It's now just two and a half miles away. The gap is stretched out. They won't get caught now this afternoon because it's one minute and five seconds back to the peloton. But you've got to get the tactic right. Imagine riding, Phil, for 160 miles, making a tactical error on the running towards the finish and losing this race by mere centimetres. And that's what Johan Museo did a number of years ago when he was going for his fourth win. He was beaten by Gianni Bugno. Yes, and how annoyed he would have been the first man ever to win this race four times. We still have three riders sit on three victories. If Bona wins, there'll be five riders on three victories. Sorry, four riders already there. Attack now by Balan. He's probably the weakest of the three when he comes to the sprint. So he's turning the screw at three kilometres to go, but they're on him. Well, that is a sign of not having too much confidence, knowing that if he's going to win, he has to win alone. Puts more pressure on Bonin to nail back the gap, but Bonin has got two Italians up against him. Although he may well have the advantage that Pippo Pozzato in the lime green helmet there was previously a teammate of Tom Bonin for many, many years on the Mappe Quickstep squad. But they will know each other. They'll know each other's mistakes, they'll know each other's weaknesses as Bonin looks at the face of the other riders now. You can see Pozzato there, that little swing of his hand there says, come on, guys, we've still got to keep working. If we mess around too far from the finish, we'll find ourselves getting caught on the running towards the line. Pozzato now waving his arm. He doesn't want to be in the front, and I can't blame him at two and a half kilometres out from the finishing line. That's about one and a quarter miles to go. He's a two-time winner of stages of the Tour de France. He won in Saint-Brieuc and in Autun. His last win coming in 07. He's won both of those stages with his sprint. And there's the attack, almost telepathy there, because Alessandro advertised it, and he's gone, heading for the two-kilometre-to-go banner. Well, as they say in professional cycling, Phil, that is uh, telephoning in advance your attack there, because he attacked from the front, but no. 
Bonin was nervous, Bonin was ready. I think he's more concerned about the rider in third position, though, because Pippo Pozzato, he ha is a prolific winner, 46 wins to his credit throughout his career, but the man trying to take advantage of the marking of the two riders in second, third position is Balan. But Balan, I believe, Phil, has uh -oh. to get away alone if he wants to win. Pozzato is in the ideal position, but they can't mess about like this. They've got to make sure they keep riding up to the final kilometre and then settle it like men. Well, Balan has quite clearly told us he can't win the sprint and he's trying desperately to get away. He's going to try and get away again before the finish. Maybe he'll be forced to go at a thousand metres, just over half a mile from the line. He looks across at Tom Bonin. Bonin will wait for Bozzato to make the first move, I would think, and try and take him on the line. Now they're allowing Balan into third wheel, the place where you can't keep an eye on him. He's sure to try again. But look at Bonin, his head is twisted half to the right-hand side. He's waiting to hear if there's the whistle of the acceleration coming. They're looking now at the banners across the road. Bonin is nervous as you can be, switching into the slipstream there of Pozzato, waiting to hear if there's any acceleration going to come at the last minute. If there is, he will accelerate with his gut. He won't wait to see uh, Balan coming by him. He will try and anticipate the move. This is such a huge race. All three won oh. the party. And there's the attack. It had to come. And Bonham was looking at Pizzato. A little late on the kick, but he's gone a 1,000 metres out from the line. He can't win from that distance, surely. And he's going to shut down again. Much too far. This was his last chance. But you see how nervous Bonin is. Now he's got his head. It's almost like a track sprinter. He keeps twisting his head round, trying to feel what's going to happen with Pizzato. Pizzato is going to wait till the last possible moment. Two Italians versus one Belgian, one Flandrian, an echte Flandrian. That's what Tom Bonin wants to be this afternoon, a real Flemish bike rider. But he's nervous, he's twitchy, and when you're nervous, you can make mistakes. Well, they've all been to this finishing line to wrecky it in the week because they'd never seen this finish before. This is a brand new finish in this event. I think the event has been very exciting because of the new course. It's projected three great names as likely winners here. And now the losing time all of the time. Balan is exactly where he doesn't want to be at 500 metres, a non-sprinter on the front. I'm afraid cannot win this race. Pizzato knows now he's got to stay cool. He's got to get the drop on Tom Bonin, probably at 250 metres. And that's the result of Cat and Mouse. As the peloton closes in rapidly, it's time to start biting your fingernails. It is much too far for the main pack now. Balan is in first position. He'll start to wind it up. That might be an advantage now for Tom Bonin, but locked onto Bonin's wheel is Pozzato. The sprint now is starting to wind up. Bonin in second. Watch out for Pozzato. So Balan has started it, and Tom Bonin's seen the finish. He's being drawn like a magnet to the line. It doesn't look like he's got the legs in Pozzato, or has he? Pozzato is coming, 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 but on the line. Tom Bonin gets it. He becomes the winner again. He joins the elite famous five club now as one of only five men to win the race three times in his career. Career. and the peloton racing in here now so it's Bonin, Pizzato and Alessandro Balan as they race for fourth place now we're not in control of the pictures so our cameras are going elsewhere and I'm not surprised Tom shakes his head what a magical couple of weeks he has had in the Belgian classics as we now commence the sprint for fourth well, coming up to the line over on the right-hand side there, it's, uh, there is Luca Paolini, who was a great sprinter many years ago, and he's going to hang on here for fourth place. On the line there, it looks, though, as if it was Greg Van Avermaet, Phil, winds it up as well for Team BMC, and I think he got fourth place just on the line there, ahead of Paolini. That's a very good result for Greg Van Avermaet, and a great day out, too, for the American Team BMC, but they have to settle the third and fourth, and not what they would have preferred, probably first and fourth as Tom Bonin now being chased down the straight here. Bonin salutes his public. It has been an incredible race for him, and it just gets better and better. The resurgence of Tomica is what they will call it here. Second in Hent Newsblad at the start of the season, a local Belgian classic. Then he had a record fifth win in the Grand Prix E3, which is named after the local freeway here, which takes you across Europe. And then just the other day, he won the other classic game, Wavergum. And now, Paul, he sits here mobbed as a three-time winner of the Ronde von Flandre. And, and there, there's Patrick Lefebvre. Patrick Lefebvre has been a team manager, Phil, back since 1983. I have to say, he uh, has managed to change with the times. We've got a brand-new team here this afternoon. 
So, well, it's all come good for Belgium. A new course, a controversial one, but it's come good with a Belgian winner. It is the 68th victory in 96 attempts by Belgian cyclists to win the Ronde van Flandre. And now, Tom Bonin joins Archiel Buis, Eric Le Mans, Fiorino Magni and Johan Museo as the only men to have won this event three times. Well, it's all joy in the Belgian tech camp here this afternoon. And obviously, Bonin, he must have been very nervous right down towards the end. He looked as if those legs were buckling underneath him, but that is his style. Pippo Pozzato came up alongside him, but in the end, he didn't have that final kick to come over the top of the big Belgian. It has been a very, very difficult race to actually read today, and the strongest men came out in the end. A huge result for Tom Bonin, and I make that his 117th win of a career which began in 2002. And more than that, Paul, it's his eighth win of this year, which is ahead of everybody else. Well, Balan is the man who starts to wind it up. And you can just see there, Bonin, uh, as soon as he sees the gap open up, as soon as he knows he's got the ability to go right the way down towards the line, he goes full gas. He can feel, he can sense the acceleration coming up alongside him, but he knows as the line gets that little bit clearer, Pozzato's not going to come past him on this occasion. Half a bicycle length is enough to be the king of Flanders for another day. He punches the air there. He had to concentrate because the photographers stand just about 50 yards after the finishing line to get the shots for the morning papers. He managed to sidestep those. They had to manoeuvre Alessandro Balan into the lead. He's the non-sprinter. He had his goes on the course. He couldn't shake him, so they forced him to open up the sprint. And then Bonan could not wait to let Pizzato alongside him because he was quick today. Well, he was, but Pizzato was in the ideal position. If he was going to win, this was the best setup he could have wished for this afternoon. But Bonan is a strong man when he gets that massive gear going. And all Pizzato could do would come up alongside him almost to half a bicycle length behind, but no closer. Uh, Filippo's sad, but he'd be delighted with second place uh, when he looks back on it tonight. I'm sure about that. It's his finest ever finish. It follows up his fifth and his sixth place finishes in the years gone by. Now, there is a typical Belgian crowd enjoying the moment here. Their man has won. And as Belgium, as you probably know, is a great country for beer, there'll be a few gallons of it drunk tonight. Achille Buissen, Fiorenzo Magni, Johan Museo, Eric Laman tussendoor and now Tom Bonen. Now Tom Bonen. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. I wasn't expecting it. I was, uh, I was even not feeling super today. I, had, uh, I don't know why, but I was feeling a little bit, a little bit tired on the race. And uh, but as the race went on, I, uh, I kept the same feeling. I think the others went tired. But then in the, the final, I. I had to count on my sprint. I was not strong enough to uh, to ride it uh, to the finish solo. But then with the three guys, this final, I think uh, it was an amazing race and with an amazing finish. Congratulations to Tom Bonin for Paul Sherwin. I'm Phil Ligger saying goodbye from Belgium. See you next week in France.